Hello and welcome again to my second lecture in perioperative pain management. This is Dr. Abdullah Turkawi. I'm currently a pain management fellow at Stanford University. In the last lecture, we uh, went about uh, the background of perioperative pain, mechanism of pain, why it's important to treat pain, and then we highlight um, how we assess pain. Um, then we spoke about risk factors and predictors of severe postoperative pain and chronic opioid use. And we wrapped up with uh, um, how we do a preventive analgesia. This lecture will be a pure pharmacology lecture. We're going to talk about um, the most common medication we encounter when we treat pain. So we're going to start with opioid, of course. Opioids are the mainstay for the treatment of acute postoperative pain, and morphine remain the gold standard. Opioid receptors are members of the G-protein coupled family, which signals via second messenger such as cyclic adenosine monophosphate. What's important about the opioid receptors that you found them almost everywhere in the pain pathway. This include the ascending pain pathway and the periphery in the spinal cord hole, supraspinally in the brainstem, thalamus, and even cortex. Furthermore, you will find them also in the descending inhibitory pain pathway in multiple nuclei and in the rostral ventral uh, medulla. You can give opioid almost through any order of admission, IV, IM, sub-Q, transcutaneous, you name it. Opioids are a class of medication that work through antagonism of various receptors. Opioid receptors can be mu, kappa, delta, and sigma. And by the way, this is um, um, when you do an anesthesia exam, um, especially for example, the basic uh, ABA board exam, they sometimes like to ask the action um, result from um, activation of different uh, receptors. So for example, M1 can cause analgesia, irritation, bradycardia, and so on, M2 respiratory depression and constipation. Delta, also uh, respiratory depression and constipation and dependence. Kappa analgesia and psychomimic effect. Uh, sigma dysphoria, hypertonia, and mediriasis. Traditionally, um, um, opioid um, has been classified to strong, intermediate, or weak. Weak, we have the codeine. Strong, we have the morphine, fentanyl, hydromorphone. Um, so based on the affinity, which is the receptor binding streak, and the intrinsic activity, efficacy, uh, producing the typical effect after binding the receptor, opioid can be divided into several groups. Antagonist and uh, 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 agonist, antagonist, and uh, mixed, like for example the nalpufin, um, agonist at the kappa and antagonist at the mu, or partial agonist, like the buprenorphine. Um, when it's important when we deal with opioid and especially when we give uh, multiple types of oral opioid it's important to understand the potency of this medication compared to the gold standard which is the opioid uh, sorry the morphine so for example what is the equivalent oral morphine dose 
of 120 milligram oral codeine. I did the math, it's 28 milligram. And if you want to know, compared to IV, it's six milligram. I'm gonna talk about how we did the math in the next slide. What's the equivalent IV morphine dose of 100 milligram oral tramadol? 3.3. What's the equivalent IV morphine dose of 100 milligram IV meberidine or pethidine? 10 milligram. So this table summarizes most commonly used opioids. So for example, and this is very important, not only for exam, it's also important for your daily clinical use. Um, there are multiple online calculators. You can use them, you are welcome to try them, but I still believe you, you need to know some basic here. So, IV morphine compared to oral morphine, IV is uh, three times more potent. Um, and uh, if you look at um, hydromorphone, four times. Uh, if you look at the oxycodone, and uh, um, it's like 1.5 times. But to to convert the uh, the oxycodone or an oxycodone to IV um, um, morphine, you divide by two. While if you want to compare uh, convert it to oral you multiply by 1.5. Meberidine, on the other hand, to convert IV to oral, multiply by three. If you want to convert oral pethidine to oral morphine, you divide by 10. If you want to convert it to IV, you divide by 30, and so on. So you may remember this. This is for the oral. So O stands for oxycodone. Every time you change from oral to IV morphine, oral opioid to IV morphine, you divide. So oxycodone, you divide by two, it's O2. Codeine, you divide by 20. Pethidine by 30, and tramadol by 30. So O2, C20, P30, T30. IV to IV opioid, you also divide oxycodone 1.5, pethidine 10, and codeine 10. This is more um, information in this table for, um, um, in case you uh, encounter other opioid that was not there in the first table. And this is another table to summarize some basic information about the dose, content, and etc. Every time you give um, any medicine, you should know the side effect of the medicine. There are a lot of side effects uh, for opioids. And this is why we always try to use the um, least amount of opioid and try to avoid it. We're going to talk about that in the coming lectures. The major thing is the respiratory depression and what they call it the sleep-related breathing disorder, which subsequently will cause hypoxia and maybe respiratory arrest. That may even lead to aspiration pneumonia. Cardiac, it can cause hypotension, bradycardia, except the meberidine that it has some atropine-like effects that would cause tachycardia. GI, it can cause nausea, vomiting, and constipation, and ileus, of course. CNS, delirium, hallucination, uh, dizziness, sedation, myoclonus. Urinary system can cause urinary retention. Endocrine, it inhibits the release of catecholamine, ADH, and cortisol. And during pregnancy, because it crosses the placenta, it can reach the fetus and may end up with addicted fetus. Um, 
and you need to make sure signs of withdrawal six to eight uh, day, six hours to eight days after delivery. Since respiratory depression is a major thing here, so we're going to talk about it more. So when you encounter any sort of respiratory depression, you have to act quickly. So start by verbal and physical stimulation of the patient. Administer oxygen. You may or may not need to bag the patient. And then you may or may not need to give naloxone. So it's important to know the dose of naloxone. And it's also important to know that naloxone usually is shorter than most of the opioid. Definitely shorter than the hydromorphone and the morphine. So keep in mind that the naloxone will wear off while you still have opioid on board. So you need to be with the patient and you may need to re-dose the medication. Patient at risk for opioid-induced sedation and respiratory depression are those with sleep apnea, morbidly obese, advanced age, opioid naive, following surgery of the upper abdomen thorax, um, those with a, a increased duration of general anesthesia, uh, thoracotomy, cardiac and pulmonary comorbidity, smokers. We cannot talk about opioid without talking about opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is based on the fact that substances that are supposed to inhibit pain perception decrease the threshold of pain or pain tolerance, presumably by central sensitization. It has been thought that at the dorsal horn level and ongoing stimulation from the periphery result in an increased number an altered response of the receptors involved in pain pathways such as NMDA. The result is hyperalgesia, which is a decreased pain threshold, or allodynia, which is pain that triggered by stimuli which do not normally provoke pain. Remifentanil is the major one that's known to cause this phenomenon. However, several studies have reported a lower quality post-operative analgesia in patients who receive morphine before surgery. So in theory, all opioid can cause um, opioid-induced hyperalgesia. To prevent this and ameliorate this phenomena, several strategies suggested all aim to reduce opioid use through um, uh, multiple, uh, use a multimodal analgesia and use medication with an MDA receptor antagonist like ketamine. When administering opioid, um, you must keep in mind the, uh, the desired onset of pain relief, duration of treatment, and, the poten and potential side effects. Lipid solubility is a main determinant of onset and duration of action of any opioid. So lipid soluble agents provide a shorter onset time because they can pass through the cell membrane more quickly and thus bind to the receptor. They also um, um, have a shorter duration of action. Um, example will be fentanyl. In contrast, morphine um, less lipid soluble opioid has a longer onset and longer duration. When we talk about metabolism, um, most of the opioids are uh, metabolized by the liver and excreted by the kidney, except um, fentanyl and methadone, um, they also occur excreted uh, via the bile. And we're going to talk about that in the, this about the, in, in the coming slides. Also, when we talk about opioid, we must talk about context-sensitive half-life, which is a terminology that describes um, the time that takes to reach 50% plasma concentration reduction when an, inf when an infusion shut off. 
The classic example that we always use that remifentanil, no matter how long the infusion will take, once you turn it off, quickly it will um, uh, um, metabolize by the ester, by esters, by esterase. And this is why it's, it's uh, one of the favorite drugs when you use Kiva. On the other hand, fentanyl, as you see here, it has an exponential um, relation with the duration. So it's not usually a good choice for long-term um, sedation or pain management. Now let's talk about um, each um, opioid. Now, of course, we're going to start with morphine. Morphine is a strong opioid and remains the gold standard against which all drugs that have strong analgesic effect are compared to. Various routes of administration are available. Although the plasma half-life of drug is approximately two hours, the analgesic um, effect of morphine can be up to four or five hours. Why is that? It's because morphine undergo hepatic glucuronidation to morphine 6 glucuronide which is an active form and it still have an analgesic form however the downside of that that um, when you have a, a patient with renal insufficiency this can accumulate and cause some side effects and this is why in renal failure dosing adjustment is necessary and monitoring of side effects is important and and if you have a patient uh, with a bad renal insufficiency it's it's even recommended not to use morphine and use something else like fentanyl or mifedrin morphine also releases histamine which is why it is sometimes associated with flushing uh, skin rash uh, tachycardia hypotension itching and bronchospasm. The onset of analgesia is rapid, is about and the peak usually within 20 minutes when you administer it IV. The dose for IV use is about one to three. You usually start with two, repeat that every five minutes until the patient achieve a, a favorable uh, pain management while keeping an eye on on the on the consciousness level on the oxygen saturation and the respiratory rate of course. IM and sub-Q can be administered but generally not recommended. Hydromorphone or Dilaudid is a semi-synthetic opioid agonist that has a slightly more rapid onset of analgesia compared with morphine. The peak effect is as little as 10 minutes when given IV, but this shorter, um, the, the, the half-life is about two and a half hours. Again, the biotransformation in the liver, uh, the active metabolites are uh, dihydromorphine and the inactive is a um, hydromorphone 3 glucuronide. The incidence of pruritus following the neuroaxial administration of hydromorphone is reported to be approximately 5% versus 11 up to 77% with morphine. So it clearly has a less pruritus than morphine. The dosing for acute pain usually is like 0.5. Maybe with elderly with less pain, you start with 0.2 and repeat that while monitoring the patient. Again, I am is not really recommended and oral can be given. Codeine is not very commonly used in, in, in the US but still used in, in many um, developing countries and as I mentioned in my previous lecture um, my intention during this course to focus in um, countries with limited resources and um, help them to use whatever they have. So codeine is very popular in, in many countries in Africa, India, and Middle East. 
it has an analgesic and antitussive uh, effect, and this is why um, sometimes we see it in an in, in antitussive uh, syrup. And it's important to keep in mind that this syrup can cause addiction. Um, codeine is a pro-drug. What does that mean? That means it needs to be activated after it enters the body. And usually, um, one of the P40, uh, P40, uh, P450 enzymes does that, which is the CYP26D. They are converted to morphine. However, what's the problem with that? That about 10 to 15 percent of patients do not metabolize codeine in this way due to different genetic makeup, and therefore they either they they can have resistance or they can have um, um, what they call it ultra rapid metabolizers. So the ultra rapid metabolizer they put the patient at risk of increased dose and uh, overdose and of course side effects while the the other group who does not the enzyme does not function very well they may not have um, good response to coding as you see here in the red color several international authorities contraindicate the use of coding in all children under the age of 12 and in children under the age of 18 after adenectomy and transillectomy. The usual dose is about 15 to 60 milligram orally every 4 to 6 hours. Um, we often see codeine combined with um, um, acetaminophene and, and, and they call that Tylenol 3. Different companies have different names, different countries have different companies. So you may see it with different names. Um, this table from Barash um, summarizes um, the implication, especially in this. Remember the 10, 15 people percent of people who uh, have um, ultra rapid metabolizer or poor metabolizer, and and the evidence beyond that. So usually we should avoid using codeine in these two groups and use something alternative. <coughs> Oxycodone is, is probably the most common oral opioid used in the U.S. for treatment of um, uh, postoperative pain. Uh, this is because of its favorable pharmacodynamics profile. So it has a high, high, high bioavailability after oral administration, which allow an easy transition from parenteral to oral form and the fact that oxycodone can also be administered to adolescent as well as elderly can be administered through IV, IM, nasal, mucosal, sub-Q, you name it. Oxycodone again metabolizes in the liver and is secreted in the kidney with the effect about four hours. So when we dose the oxycodone, usually we start with five milligram and repeat that every four hours up to six hours and, and if the patient really having bad pain we can increase it to 10 milligram every um, uh, three uh, hours um, sometimes it's used as an IV and uh, you can use it in uh, PCA and uh, I left the dose here for you fentanyl is an um, another commonly used opioid um, it's relatively selective neuroreceptor agonist which is considered to have almost 100 times the potency of morphine. Again, metabolized in the liver, however, uh, excreted in urine and bile. And this is why it's suitable for patient renal failure. Again, the drug available in multiple uh, forms can give through multiple routes. Um, it's also, as we mentioned, uh, it's more lipid soluble than morphine, so this is why it has a more rapid onset than morphine, usually about two minutes with the peak about four minutes. Um, <clears throat> the elimination half-life about two to four hours and doesn't have a histamine release with it. So it's a preferred when you have a patient with hemodynamic instability or um, bad asthma.
the dosing for IV from 25 to 50 and can be repeated every five minutes until you, uh, 50, five minutes until you achieve um, a good pain control or um, you start to feel that the patient gets more sedated and uh, start to have um, uh, side effect issues. Sulfentanil is um, another um, uh, potent opioid. It's about 1,000 more potent than morphine because it's very lipophilic. Um, common areas where we use it, usually in cardiac surgeries because it has a really um, um, good hemodynamic um, profile. Uh, the other um, area where we can use it in epidural because it has an excellent uh, high potency. So we can use it in epidural for, for patient with opioid dependent. Remifentanil is an ultra short acting uh, synthetic opioid. Um, the potency of the drug almost equivalent to fentanyl. So when you dose it, think about the dose, very similar to fentanyl. Remifentanil is rapidly degraded by tissue and plasma esterase and that's explain its incredibly short terminal elimination half-life despite the duration of infusion. Um, one disadvantage we already mentioned is the potential for development of opioid induced hyperalgesia and, and, and this is why it's really failed out of favor uh, by many anesthesiologists. Meberidine, on the other hand, or pethidine, again, it's not very commonly used in the US, except, I guess, sometimes for shivering. Uh, however, it's very common in developing countries. Um, it's a synthetic mu opioid receptor agonist with a relatively short half life. Again, it's metabolized in the liver. However, when the flam, it metabolizes to a normepiridine, which turns out that it's potentially neurotoxic metabolite. It has a long half-life, up to 16 hours, and repetitive dosing of meberidine can cause accumulation of norepiridine, which may precipitate myoclonus and even seizure. So it decreases, it lowers the seizure threshold. Um, it's therefore recommended that the total daily IV dose in an otherwise healthy adult without renal or CNS issues should not exceed 600 mg per day and should not be administered for longer than 24, 48 hours. Um, the dose um, is say 0.5 to 1 mg per kilogram. Uh, always go with the uh, uh, preservative dose and uh, increase it if uh, the patient requires. It's important to know it's contraindicating patient receiving now inhibitors and SSRI and SNRI. Why? Because it precipitates serotonin syndrome and as you know serotonin syndrome can present by muscle rigidity, hyperpyrexia, fever and seizures. Mepiridine has a slower rate of metabolism in elderly. We're going to talk about um, elderly to more uh, in the next lecture. Um, Mepiridine is not a good choice for PCA because it accumulates, as I mentioned. And, and uh, Mepiridine should not be used during lactation uh, for an extended period of time as it may cause neurobehavioral changes in infants. Methadone. Methadone is a unique opioid by the fact that it, it has a broad spectrum um, receptor activation profile. So it's not only um, agonist for the mu receptor, it, it antagonizes the NMDA and it inhibits the MAO uh, uh, um, uh, monoamide transmitter um, uh, reuptake. And this is why uh, um, people find it useful for neuropathic pain. Uh, the drug is extensively metabolized in the liver, but again, 
um, excreted through bile and urine. What does that mean? That means it can be used with patient with renal insufficiency like fentanyl. Methadone has elimination half-life of 22 hours and following a single dose, the duration of analgesia approximately 3 to 6 hours. But with repetitive dosing, methadone can accumulate and slow tissue release into blood stream can result in a long elimination half-life of up to 120 hours and duration of analgesia of 8 to 12 hours. This is very important when you start to treat chronic patients and think about the dosing and how you taper the methadone up and down. Tramadol or Altram, um, again, it's popular in developing countries. Um, it, and it's, it's, an ang it's an agonist for the mu receptor. However, it also inhibits um, monoamide reuptake. It also has some effect on the, on the norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake. This explains the side effect profile. Tramadol lycodine is a prodrug which is metabolized in the liver by the um, CYP2D6 and for, uh, P450 uh, to the active metabolite M1 which has 200 times greater mu receptor affinity than um, tramadol. The same issue like codeine, about 10% of people, they have some problems with this enzyme. And so the same application like codeine will apply here. Recommended dosing is uh, 50 to 100 milligram every four to six hours, not to exceed 400 milligram in 20, Four hours. Patients over one year of age are given one milligram per kilogram every four to six hours. Drug available uh, with, in, in combination with um, acetaminophen or sometimes with uh, non-steroidal and it has side effect uh, like any other opioid plus um, um, the, the potential to cause the serotonin syndrome when you administer it with other serotonin um, um, increasing uh, medication. Um, as you see here, the FDA issued a warning that tramadol should not be used to treat pain in all children younger than 12 years and in children younger than 18 after removal of tonsils and adenoids. However, there is no European um, uh, warning like this, and this is why you will find um, people sometimes use it in children. Uh, this table um, summarizes the, uh, the opioid that I um, um, explained the last few slides. You can go back to them. Now let's talk about non-opioid analgesic and of course, we're going to start with the NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, very commonly used drug. It has anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and antipyretic effect. The therapeutic benefit of uh, NSAIDs is believed to be mediated through the inhibition of COX enzyme. Um, and as you know, we have type 1 and 2. Uh, and it has been proven in multiple studies, even meta-analysis, that NSAIDs uh, can reduce opioid consumption, pain intensity, nausea, vomiting, and sedation. Unlike opioid, NSAIDs exhibit a ceiling effect. What does that mean? That means we should respect the maximum energetic effect. If you keep giving more medication that will not improve the analgesic effect. It's not like opioid. So again, um, NSAID inhibit the cyclooxygenase, uh, um, 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 COX-1 and 2. COX-1 is present in all tissues, including gastric mucosa, um, and, and um, so it inhibits uh, prostaglandin, 
in table from Boxan and this explain the side effect profile. However, crit COPS2 is an a, a inducible enzyme and is produced primarily at the site of inflammation and responsible for the pain, inflammation, and fever. So COPS2 um, antagonist, um, uh, it will affect the prostaglandin E2 and it's supposed to be uh, free of most of the side effects from uh, 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 COX-1 inhibition. Um, peripherally, prostaglandin do not directly mediate pain. Rather, they contribute to hyperalgesia by sensitizing nociceptors. Centrally, although prostaglandin enhance pain transmission at the level of the dorsal pore. So that explains the effect of NSAIDs. As we know, when we talk about NSAIDs, based on the selectivity of uh, blocking the COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme, um, we divide them by selective, non-selective, or semi-selective. When you go all the way to the right, aspirin is purely non-selective and irreversible NSAID. You go all the way to the left, uh, siloxicrit is um, COX-2 selective. So it, it doesn't have the GI and the platelet problems. However, we're going to talk about that. It, it, it had been shown to have some problem with the um, cardiovascular patient. So when we, when, when we generally inhibit prostaglandin, um, this uh, um, available in the lung, in the kidney, in uh, almost everywhere. So you can have some uh, problem with patient with asthma. You can have nephrotoxicity with the long-term use. So you should be caution when we give NSAIDs, especially non-selective, to patient with asthma, patient with GI bleed or ulceration, patient with uh, coagulation problems, patient with cardiac failure, and renal failure, and hepatic failure. This table summarizes the common side effect. We still have more side effects, for instance, than this, but this is the common. Biggest one, platelet dysfunction. So it is recommended that in the OR, just wait to make sure that you have a good hemostasis before giving NSAIDs. GI it can cause ulceration and bleeding. And there is some thought that NSAID um, may um, affect the anastomosis in the colorectal uh, surgery, but this is controversial. A kidney, it causes nephrotoxicity mainly the non-selective. The risk of nephrotoxicity is increased in patients with hypovolemia, congestive heart failure, and chronic renal insufficiency. Um, when you use non-selective, it has been shown that it affects boo infusion. This is why multiple orthopedic surgeons, they don't like uh, to give it in major orthopedic surgery like spine uh, uh, fusion. Um, the, this effect in COX-2, though, it appears to be less or minimal, um, and um, the use of selective COX-2 is really controversial. There is really no recommendation uh, against the use of COX-2 in these people. And COX-2 um, selective inhibitors, we have few medication, two of them, as you see, has been retracted from the market in the US because of the proven side effect of adverse cardiovascular risk. So what we have nowadays is the siloxicrip, which is, um, can be dosed as 400 milligram, followed by 200 milligram already every 12 hours for several days. COX-2 
specific inhibitor and this is why it has some warning when we use it with patients with coronary artery disease. It, it's a, the, one of the potential advantages, um, reduction of incidence of, of GI ulceration, platelet inhibition, however, um, the, it affects the blood flow to the kidney and, and metriuresis uh, and, and glomerular filtration rate. So, um, COX-2 inhibitor can cause fluid retention and hypertension. And it is not recommended to prescribe COX-2 um, in patients with known coronary artery disease. Ipoprofen is very commonly used, uh, mainly orally. Uh, they use anywhere from 400 to 800 milligram. The same for IV and with a maximum daily dose, 300, 3,200 milligram. Ketorolac is a very uh, potent uh, non-steroid that can be given IV or IM. The, put, the optimal dose of ketorolac for post pain is 15 to 30 every 6 to 8 hours, not to exceed 5 days. People always confuse five days with five doses, but it's five days. A standard dose is 30 milligram of ketorolac, provide energy is equivalent almost 10 milligram. It's really potent. Uh, ketorolac, as other NSAIDs, can inhibit platelet aggregation and prolong bleeding time, therefore should be used with caution in patient at risk of postoperative hemorrhage. So always communicate with the surgeon and make sure that they are not worried about bleeding. Diclofenac, uh, which is marketed as Voltaren and many other uh, brands based on the company and country, sometimes mixed with sodium, sometimes with potassium. It's available as an oral injectable. Uh, it's contraindicated in pregnancy and during lactation, as you see. And the dose, initial dose, uh, 50 milligram orally three times. The total dose per day should not exceed 150 milligram per 24 hour in adult. Can be given an IM, IV, but when you give it an, uh, as an IV, make sure you give it slowly. This is another table to summarize um, the answers that we uh, spoke about. Uh, also, dose duration. Acetaminophen or paracetamol, very, very popular because it's cheap, available everywhere. It has an antipyretic and analgesic effect. It has been thought that the drug is primarily as, uh, uh, act centrally uh, by inhibiting COX enzyme with a minimal peripheral effect, which explain um, the, the, the clean uh, profile uh, when we talk about bleeding and GI bleeding and platelet inhibition. Um, acetaminophen is devoted from many side effects, as I said, uh, that associated from NSAIDs, um, and is uh, well known to be an opioid sparing drug. can be used in conjugation with NSAIDs as part of multimodal analgesic. Indeed, it's highly recommended to be used for everyone unless contraindicated. Um, it's almost entirely metabolized by the liver and it's secreted in the urine. So um, it, it is indeed a contraindicated in patients with severe hepatic insufficiency or severe progressive liver disease. Um, people with severe renal insufficiency like creatine clearance less than 30, it's recommended to use a longer uh, dosing interval and reduce the total daily dose. Uh, IV um, paracetamol may be used in patient in whom oral rectal is not an option. The IV uh, onset effect uh, way quicker, it's about 5 to 10 minutes, and the, uh, and the peak time is 15 minutes compared to the rectal or oral. The addition of acetaminophen to NSAID within a multimodal regime 
can improve pain control and reduce post-operative morphine consumption and is more effective than NSAID alone. The use of IV dose for patient over 50 kg should be uh, reduced and not to exceed 4 g per day. Can be given orally as you see and rectally. Let's shift gear and talk about alpha 2 receptor agonist. And when we talk about alpha 2 uh, agonist, here we are talking about clonidine and dexmedetomidine, which um, act on the presynaptic, uh, activate the presynaptic uh, alpha 2 receptor that result in uh, uh, decreased release of norepinephrine and uh, it has been believed that this might be how it uh, mediates analgesic although the mechanism is not fully understood alpha 2 agonists also reduce the undesirable physiologic and psychological effect of opioid and uh, we talk about clonidine usually has a longer half-life it's about 10 hours it can be administered um, um, for analgesia, sedation, and exolysis. Uh, clonidine can be administered orally, transdermally, IV, perineurally, uh, epidurally, you name it. Uh, although not routinely used, uh, preoperative oral uh, 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 clonidine has been shown to provide preoperative hemodynamic stability and reduce the requirement of postoperative opioid. Uh, analgesia can be used as I said as a pre-medication and there are uh, some studies that should benefit um, it can be combined with local anesthetic um, always remember when we when you and uh, when you uh, stimulate the alpha 2 receptor you will have some side effect like hypotension sedation bradycardia more though with dexmetomity which has a shorter half-life about two hours has a greater affinity to um, uh, alpha-2 uh, uh, receptor compared to um, uh, clonidine, as you can see. Uh, analgesia has been thought to be mediated supraspinally and spinally and peripherally. Dexmetomidine is a potent and highly selective alpha-2 uh, agonist which demonstrates cardioprotective, neuroprotective, renoprotective effect um, and the drug has been described as a useful and safe adjunct in numerous clinical situations, include premedication prior to intubation, extubation, uh, sedation, awake intubation, uh, adjunct to um, uh, regional analgesia uh, during awake crony, intraoperative. It has been, it is a very popular um, analgesic uh, drug nowadays. However, as I mentioned, um, uh, one of the potential side effects will be the bradycardia and hypotension. If you give it slowly, uh, you will uh, avoid these side effects. Slowly with low doses and increase as you need. Uh, these are the doses here for um, IV, IM, spinal, epidural, peripheral, intranasal. And, and now we're going to talk about uh, gabapentin. And here we, uh, we mean gabapentin, urantin, and brigablin, which is larica. Uh, they work in um, alpha-2 um, um, subunit calcium channel ligand. And um, uh, initially, this was a seizure effect. But um, in the last few years, um, people found benefit using it in neuropathic pain and chronic pain. And in the last few years, um, researchers try to introduce that to the acute postoperative pain. We're going to talk about that. So the antinociceptive mechanism of action of gabapentin has two aspects: modulation of calcium-induced release, the dorsal horn level, and activation of the descending uh, uh, noradrenergic pathway in the spinal cord and the brain. Studies found decreased incidence of postoperative delirium, vomiting, paralysis, urinary retention associated with perioperative use of these drugs, probably secondary to their opioid sparing effect. 
common side effect, sedation, headache, dizziness, visual disturbances. Um, even though it's safer than opioid, but respiratory depression has been reported in older patients and in those who receive Gabapentin along with other analgesics. The optimal dose and the number of doses of Gabapentin have not been determined. Higher doses or more prolonged therapy may be used and may be more effective but may result in a greater sedation. The literature regarding the efficacy of gabapentin for post-operative pain control is inconclusive and seems to be not supportive. Lidocaine. Lidocaine becoming more and more popular. I personally like using lidocaine. I recommend it. Uh, I, I did a, a few research um, in, in lidocaine perioperative area. Lidocaine has been shown to be analgesic, has some analgesic, anti-hyperalgesic, and this is probably why um, it's useful in the perioperative area. It's not really that strong analgesic, but the anti-hyperalgesic uh, and anti-inflammatory effect um, found to be useful. Um, lidocaine are mediated by uh, um, inhibitory action in the uh, voltage-gated uh, sodium channel, calcium channel, potassium channel, some research find NMDA effect, and other receptors. The perioperative infusion of lidocaine has been shown to improve postoperative analgesia in patients receiving, recovering from laparoscopic colectomy. Also, it has been shown to decrease the postoperative opioid requirement, attenuate post um, operative ileus and accelerate time to discharge from hospital. Lidocaine infusion is contraindicated in um, a main patient with arrhythmias, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and um, Stoke Adams disease, and heart block, of course. The ideal dose of systemic lidocaine has yet to be clearly defined. However, that's what we recommend. Uh, 1.5 to 2 milligram, followed by an infusion 1.5 to 2 milligram per kilogram per hour. This is a nice review and uh, um, showed how um, we usually um, use this lidocaine. Start with induction, continue it uh, in the intraoperative time through PACU, uh, even in day one and day two, based on the severity of pain and the type of surgery. Although there has uh, been a, a, a long history of using um, IV lidocaine in acute and chronic pain, the literature on benefit effect of perioperative IV lidocaine is inconclusive. When we talk about acute pain, um, there is weak signals and um, not all surgeries, interestingly, um, found benefit. Um, However, um, as I mentioned, due to, it seems that due to its antihyperalgesic effect, um, it, we, we are having more and more growing evidence nowadays that it has a beneficial effect in reducing the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. Magnesium um, becoming more popular as part of multimodal analgesia nowadays. Um, um, the, its effect in the NMDA receptor uh, found to be useful. IV magnesium though, there is um, some evidence that it helps reduce pain and opioid. However, again, it's not that strong analgesic, but when we put them all together, um, um, this is um, the, the, the concept of multimodal analgesia. Uh, glucocorticoid uh, steroid have um, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and anti-emetic. Um, we use it in the anesthesia during surgery as an anti-emetic, but also, believe it or not, it has some analgesic e effect. Again, it's not that um, big effect, but when you put them together, 
with the perioperative with the multimodal analgesia um, you can get some benefit with analgesia um, it has been also added to uh, local anesthesia in nerve block and it has been shown to prolong the duration of effect ketamine coming back as an analgesic in the perioperative um, um, time uh, ketamine um, has a non-competitive reversible inhibitory uh, effect on the NMDA receptor and this explains a lot of the benefit that we um, found with ketamine interestingly it also works to a lesser extent in the uh, mu receptor uh, monoaminergic uh, receptor uh, and others uh, as you may know, um, ketamine has a, a carbon to atom, and it exists as um, um, racemic or uh, stereoisomers, S or R. S ketamine has a four-fold greater affinity for NMDA receptor, stronger analgesic. I'm mentioning that because um, not everywhere you will find the S version of ketamine and it's especially if you are in developing countries um, it's it's it would be helpful to know if you have an S or R ketamine because I'm gonna show you in another slide how we're gonna dose them differently in the US we uh, uh, commonly have the S ketamine we use it and uh, we use low dose intravenous ketamine has been proven uh, uh, very effective in management of perioperative pain opioid sparing uh, improved pain scores and the most recommended dosing will be a start with a bolus um, usually um, uh, before the uh, uh, surgery started before the incision 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kilogram uh, followed by infusion anywhere between 0.1 to 0.5 the higher it will go the higher incidence of uh, uh, hallucination after surgery um, um, I would not go uh, higher than 0.1 or 0.2 with elderly uh, the infusion uh, it's recommended to be uh, discontinued or the dose reduced uh, like 60 minutes before uh, the end of surgery so um, you can wake up the patient again uh, ketamine has accessory neurotransmitter stimulation of the NMDA receptor which is believed to be involved in the development and maintenance of several phenomena including persistent postoperative pain, hypersensitivity, wind up uh, hyperalgesia allodynia and opioid induced tolerance as well as opioid induced hyperalgesia there may be also a rule for ketamine in the prevention and treatment of post-operative chronic pain research still ongoing and we have more and more evidence supporting this um, the risk of um, psychomimetic adverse effect such as hallucination may be the cause of clinical reduction to use of ketamine however if you give one milligram or two milligram of midazolam before surgery before using ketamine it has been shown to um, uh, reduce the incidence of hallucination it's important to know the um, onset of action the time to peak and the duration of action so you can time the administration um, this is a nice review and um, it administers the concept how we can use ketamine for prevention of pathologic pain after severe tissue injury ketamine administration should cover the entire duration of high intensity noxious and inflammatory stimuli as you can see here if you start with a bolus before the skin insertion you have to repeat it or use infusion before um, and before like immobilization 
that uh, it trigger more uh, bathologic pain. If you use it as a repeated boluses um, or infusion, you may be able to um, uh, have a preventive uh, uh, prevention against pathologic pain. This is the table that I mentioned with the doses for uh, R and S ketamine. Um, this is a very uh, recent recommendation um, from the American Academy of Pain Medicine and American and ASA and uh, ASRA um, indicating the indication dosing relative contraindication for ketamine. Um, when you give any drug, you should know the side effect. And for ketamine, it has numerous side effects. We should know them and we should know how to deal with them. Um, obviously, um, cardiovascular, uh, tachycardia, uh, uh, hypotension, uh, hypertension, but sometimes rarely can cause hypertension. Uh, CNS can cause hallucination. Um, ketamine is traditionally avoided in people with or at risk of uh, uh, in ICP. Um, due to concern about ketamine causing increased ICP. Uh, however, recent study uh, proved that it does not increase ICP more than opioid. So um, it can be used in this population. Um, it can cause sometimes, especially if you um, uh, impact you, if you're using a ketamine, sometimes you will see uh, jerky movement, myoclonus, um, this can be a side effect of ketamine. However, you should always rule out um, major things, dangerous things like seizure and, and, and stroke and examine the patient before you point down to ketamine. And usually this responded uh, very well with midazolam. Uh, when it comes to airway, it's very really well known to increase the um, secretion and it has a good bronchodilator effect. Uh, finally, um, I'm gonna talk briefly about non-pharmacological methods. Patient education is essential. The patient have an understanding um, uh, of the likely etiology of their pain, reassurance and setting realizing realistic expectation are very important. Set the expectation of the patient about the expected severity and duration of postoperative pain. Don't tell the patient that this is not gonna be painful. If it's painful, tell the patient this is painful. If the patient worry about surgery, why I'm in severe pain, explain why the patient is in severe pain, reassure the patient, and education, reassuring, communication, very important. Psychological method, again, like um, distraction, biofeedback, very important. Um, cold compress sometimes can be used. Cold increases the threshold of pain, reduce uh, local swelling and muscle spasm. It is used for a limited period of time after like tooth extraction, uh, small surgical procedure on the knee, uh, minor incision, and so on. Uh, however, heat, on the other hand, uh, can relax the muscle and improve joint mobility. It is not uh, used in the treatment of acute post-surgical pain as it increases the risk of bleeding and edema. But if you are not worried about bleeding and edema, you can uh, use some um, heat um, uh, compress. Abdominal binder is another thing you can use it for uh, abdominal surgery. Um, Problem with abdominal surgery every time the patient cough or move uh, the, the incision move and it can trigger pain So sometimes just by asking the patient to put an abdominal binder and while they are mobilizing or they are coughing it can help minimizing this movement and uh, helping with pain acupuncture Still not great benefit not great evidence, but Every now and then you will see some uh, studies showing that, yeah, it's, it's better than placebo. 
it's still um, we, we still um, uh, I think we still far away before we routinely implement acupuncture in post-operative pain, acute post-operative pain. Uh, rehabilitation, improved post-operative course, uh, shorter recovery, hospital stay, and uh, can improve pain, especially with uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Um, again, these are uh, some of my references and uh, uh, 